Today, we gather to honor and celebrate an organization and the people in that organization with values that the League of Women Voters holds dear. The Ohio Innocence Project and Mr. Mark Godsey, Director, are receiving the League of Women Voters of the Cincinnati Area's 2017 Making Democracy Work Award for efforts and successes in building a better community. I welcome the Honorable John Cranley to the podium to introduce the Ohio Innocence Project. said, I'll be back in five minutes, <laughs> which I think was a message to me. It's a huge honor to be here with all of you to uh, help honor an organization that I'm so proud of to have been part of, and I'll get uh, into that in a second. But first, let me say thanks to the League of Women Voters, a phenomenal organization that is essential to our democracy. And, uh, <laughs> and I have to say, it, in light of recent events, it, it's only more important than, than ever before uh, for people to stand up and to defend the civic institutions that make our, our democracy work, as Tocqueville said so many hundreds of years ago, um, that we have civil society, we have organizations like the League of Women Voters, and at times when the government is run by people who don't appreciate a lot of our historical uh, institutions, uh, making sure we support organizations like the League of Women Voters becomes all the more important. And the Cincinnati chapter in particular has been a great asset for this community for a very long time. Uh, my grandmother was a member and active, uh, and my mother and, and so many others. Um, but it's also, I think, a particularly poignant moment um, to think about Cincinnati's contributions in light of recent national events. You know, as we all know, since that he was the landing place of freedom from the Underground Railroad Freedom Center, uh, I mean, for the Underground Railroad itself. And Harriet Beecher Stowe, of course, was a, a great Cincinnati woman who uh, contributed mightily to the change in culture of this country that led to the Civil War and the emancipation uh, of uh, the slaves. It's also the case that in the 1930s, as it is now being talked about, uh, to repeal Obamacare, which I oppose repealing it, that in the 1930s, Cincinnati established health clinics for the poor and was way ahead of the curve, you know, 80 years ahead of the curve uh, of providing a safety net for people without health care. And it's a tradition that we continue today. And unfortunately, we may need to revive that tradition if they succeed in repealing Obamacare. It's also the case that we're celebrating today the Innocence Project, um, the importance of due process, checks and balances, and the judiciary. And it is the, through judicial intervention and le legal intervention that we're able to free as many people as we have freed over the last 13 years. And it's an important check and balance on the other branches of government, and I serve as mayor of the city in another branch of government that for often for unintentional reasons, bad mistakes are made and you need a judicial check. And if you think about the attacks on the judiciary that the president has made over the last couple of days, uh, the firing of Sally Yates a week and a half ago for having the nerve to say that she believed that the order was unconstitutional, these are important and scary times. And once again, uh, like the Underground Railroad, like the health clinics, Cincinnati uh, is at the cutting edge of standing up for these uh, rights. And let's face it, the Bill of Rights is an essential foundation of this country, which includes many things, not the least of which is the general principle of habeas corpus, which is the basis upon which the Innocence Project is able to bring cases of people who have already been convicted. And once again, when we have a national political climate that is calling into question religious freedom and the First Amendment, 
which is the first part of the Bill of Rights. And we have uh, a president attacking the judiciary, uh, standing up as we did recently to declare that we're going to remain a sanctuary city and bragging about the wonderful accomplishments of the Innocence Project is exactly what is needed at this time uh, with courage and conviction uh, to keep protecting the great institutions and civic institutions of our country. Now specifically, and then I'll get off the stage, I want to thank uh, the many, many people who helped make the Innocence Project a reality um, over many years, including not the least of which Francie Pepper, who's sitting in the front row, was one of our earliest and most generous contributors that got us off the ground. I see Steve Black is here from the board. Uh, and of course, it's only fair to represent that the Rosenthal family have made extraordinarily historic investments in the endowment size gifts that they have made over many years that have made so much of our work possible. Um, it is one of the greatest honors of my life that with Mark Gotze, who you're gonna hear from in a minute, who's one of my best friends, uh, that we did start this program together uh, 13 years ago, roughly, and uh, I did work on it full time, in addition to being a city council member for about five years. And I think when I was on over five years, we got maybe two or three people out. And since then, they averaged two or three a year. So my leaving was great for the Innocence Project <laughs> and for the work of the Innocence Project. But uh, and my mother, or my, not my mother, my wife uh, recently ended a long, wonderful term on the Board of Trustees and raising money, and we do our part at continuing to this day. So I'll let Mark Gotze give you more of the details on the project itself, but I am deeply proud to have co-founded it, and I'm proud at this moment in time to stand up for these principles of standing up for due process and making sure that innocent people get out of prison. Thank you very much. The Ohio Innocence Project Mark Godsey, his colleagues, and the many participating law students are proud examples of how, if we put our beliefs and our actions and our values into action, we can change lives for the better. The League of Women Voters of the Cincinnati area is pleased to present the Ohio Innocence Project, our 2017 Making Democracy Work Award. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Mark Godsey. Thank you very much to the League of Women Voters for honoring the Ohio Innocence Project. And uh, I accept this on behalf of all the staff and the students at UC Law School and the supporters. Um, which, as John mentioned, we have some key supporters here in the room. John, as he mentioned, co-founded the Innocence Project here at UC Law School with me and was a full-time employee for several years before leaving to run for Congress the first time. Um, many of you uh, don't know this, but you can probably imagine, John's a hell of a trial lawyer. And I got to be sitting there and be his co-counsel uh, on during a couple of our first exonerations in court where he had never even been in court before, but got up and just did a fantastic job presenting the evidence and uh, help free a few of our early clients. And today, um, after 13 years, the Innocence Project here just at UC has freed 24 innocent Ohioans to, um, <laughs> together served over 450 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Um, and we can attribute that to the support of a lot of people in this room. Some early people, Al Gerhard Stein, who's in the back, as, as John mentioned, Francie Pepper, the Pepper family, have been huge supporters of ours from the beginning. Representatives from the Season Good Foundation. Uh, we have Steve Black, who's the president of our board. Uh, so it takes a lot of people to come together in the blood, sweat, and tears of a lot of students, a lot of law students over the years, um, to make this work and to, to get these innocent people out of prison. So the award is uh, Making De Democracy Work, so I just want to talk for a minute about the different ways we try to make democracy, democracy work, the, try, the ways we try to open it up. Um, and one is this, um, government, and I think it's not just government, it's human nature, uh, but in particular, government doesn't want to admit mistakes. 
And so one of the things we see in our work, we will investigate a case and we'll develop evidence that somebody in prison for a serious crime, murder or rape is innocent. And if I were to go and just meet some friends in a bar and tell them about this evidence, they would go, wow, that guy's innocent. That, that guy should be out. Um, but you go present it to the government, to the judges who were responsible for the wrongful conviction and the prosecutors, and it's a knee-jerk, absolutely not sort of denial, um, refusal to admit mistakes. And when we started in 2003, back when John was litigating some of the cases, you saw that sort of knee-jerk reaction um, very, very strongly throughout the state of Ohio. And as we've won more cases and we've um, made people realize, I think gradually, one of our goals is that it's okay to admit mistakes, that human beings error and any system that is run by human beings like the criminal justice system will have error and that good government and democracy is about open-mindedness and being open to our human errors and in fact embracing those and only by embracing human error can we be open to reform and the types of changes that need to happen to mitigate human error so that's that's one area and i think we've seen gradual change in our state as a result of, of our work and the work of our, all our supporters. We see less resistance now than we did 13 years ago. In 2010, Governor Strickland signed a massive uh, innocence reform bill called Senate Bill 77, which changed the way police officers do uh, eyewitness identification lineups and interrogations and all sorts of things. Uh, when I first started talking about the need for reform in 2003 to legislatures up in Columbus, I got looked at like I had three heads, right? And just through talking and talking and winning cases, eventually, by 2010, people were nodding along with us and we got the bill passed. And so, you know, making democracy work is about helping people understand the need for reform and the admission of, of human error. Another really important piece that I don't think people recognize, I mean, people see the Innocence Project about getting innocent people out, which is obviously fantastic, um, but we're trying to teach law students how to be activists on the ground. And you know, when you're just a low law student and you're reading this file uh, and you're the one that's responsible for investigating this case, if you wanna come forward and say, hey, the state's wrongfully convicted this person, it's 22-year-old law student against the state of Ohio, right? Uh, and so it's a David versus Goliath situation and we, our students go in and they win those cases. And so win or lose, I think our goal is for students to realize that even the smallest person in a democracy can take on the state and has a duty to speak up when they see injustice. Uh, and so that's one of our goals. So, so um, in many different ways, I think we're trying to make democracy work. I wanna just quickly, I know I'm supposed to tell you about the Innocence Project. I'm just gonna tell you about one of our cases in closing. The, um, of the 24, one of our clients that we freed, Ricky Jackson, set the record for the longest serving person in U.S. history to be exonerated, and he spent almost 40 years in prison, 39 and a half years in prison, um, and the first two and a half of those were on death row. He was wrongfully convicted in 1975 with his two best childhood friends. They had just turned 18 when they were picked. They had clean records when they were picked up and charged with a murder they didn't commit, sent to death row. Uh, Ricky came within two months of his execution date back in 1977, and his two best friends, the Bridgman brothers, one came two weeks from his execution date and one came eight days from his execution date when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled Ohio's death penalty statute unconstitutional, and everybody on death row in Ohio got moved to life in prison until Ohio reenacted a new death penalty statute. So, but for absolute luck, of the clock, um, all three would have been executed back in the 1970s. They always protest their innocence, and um, the, the case against them was built on the testimony of a 12-year-old boy. Um, the case happened because it was a, a Cleveland, an African-American neighborhood in Cleveland, 1975. Um, broad daylight, a man comes walking out of a deli. Um, he was responsible for picking up the money orders and things every day, and he, he kept them in a briefcase, and as he walked out, um, three youths approached him, threw acid in his face, shot and killed him, and took the briefcase. And as you can imagine, a crowd gathered rather quickly, police gathered, and a 12-year-old boy walked up to the police and said, I saw this and I know who did it. And through talking to him, he eventually identified Ricky Jackson and his two friends. 
Um, we later learned that he went home and told his mom that he had made it up. And his mom said, you know, just go down to the police station tomorrow and tell him you lied. And when he tried to do that, the police screamed at him and said, we know you were telling the truth yesterday. Who's tried to pressure you and pressured him into sticking to his story? Um, and all three of them were convicted and sent to death row based on the testimony of a 12-year-old boy. Um, these guys screamed their innocence for decades. And when we got involved in the case, we knew the case hinged on the testimony of Ed Vernon, that 12-year-old boy who was now in his 50s. Um, and we reached out to him through our students, tracked him down, called him up and said, we want to talk to you about this case. And he said, I don't want to talk to you and hung up. Flash forward a year or so later, Ed Vernon got very sick and was in the hospital and believed he was dying. And his pastor visited him. And his pastor said, you know, I've, I've always thought that you've been carrying a burden and uh, you just seem somebody who's been troubled to me, like there's something you want to get off your chest. And at that moment, when Ed thought he was very sick and might not survive, he broke down and started crying to his pastor and said, I lied when I was 12 years old and I sent three innocent men to death row and it's ruined my life. Um, and through that, we were able to get in touch with Ed again and get his affidavit and go to court and ultimately get the conviction overturned. Um, I mentioned earlier about the, the necessary open-mindedness of a democracy and the willingness to admit mistakes. And I, I told you about Ricky's case because I, I think he's a good example of that. Um, we had a hearing in November of 2014 where Ed Vernon came and testified before the court and he described his lie when he was 12 years old and how the lie had ruined his life. The judge and the prosecutors heard the testimony listened to Ricky Jackson testify, and then listened to other evidence we had developed that proved his innocence, and ultimately agreed to exonerate Ricky Jackson, something that a prosecutor would not have done when we first started 13 years ago, just an example of the changing attitude. After Ricky was freed, he said, there's one thing I want to do, it's very important. Can you give me the, the number of the pastor, Ed Vernon's pastor? Ed Vernon was the 12-year-old boy who was now in his 50s. We later learned that Ricky called the pastor and said, I'd like to meet with Ed Vernon. The pastor set up a meeting. They met and Ricky approached him and hugged him and said, I forgive you. I want you to live a good life. So Ricky tried to overcome his greatest bias um, and give justice to Ed Vernon, just like the state was unable to give to him for 40 years, and that's the kind of example that we try to emulate and the example of democracy. So, thank you. <laughs> One last comment. Time Magazine has an issue coming out dedicated to the innocence movement. It's a huge honor for the innocence movement. You know how they do these dedicated issues like Pearl Harbor or Mary Tyler Moore, or you know, at the grocery store when you check out. They've actually done one. We've got an early copy. I'll start seeing them on the grocery store shelves. And they picked our project in Ohio as the feature project. There's 10 pages on the Ohio Innocence Project, <laughs> including, uh, including Ricky Jackson's story. So you'll be able to learn more about it if you pick this up. Thank you all very, very much. Very honored to accept this on behalf of uh, the Innocence Project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godsey. Oops. Try with it. Now I don't know which one works. Um, I've learned that Mimi Gingold and um, Al Gerhardstein, the, the recipients of last year's uh, Making Democracy Work Award are here, and I'd like to introduce them to you. Um, could you stand, please? Please continue to enjoy yourselves. We'll be back near the end of the event.
Just a reminder, the silent auction closes at 3.45. Um, did I miss anything, Melissa? <laughs> no, okay. I have a feeling I missed something, but I, I guess not. Um, so start eating again if you'd like. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.